I'll tell you, it's wonderful to know tonight that His grace is sufficient. And uh, that's uh, one of the areas I want to deal with tonight. It's good to see you here. And I want to read to you a promise uh, out of the Word of God that uh, I believe the Lord wants me to use tonight is to share with you what's on my heart. I have found in my own Christian experience through the years, uh, 31 years as an evangelist, that uh, I have a tendency to uh, go through a crisis and then... uh, when I go through that crises, I, I go through several of them, and then I sort of level off. And I, I just sort of level off, and, and then God has to let another big crisis come along uh, to get me to grow any. And then I level off again. And um, the Bible doesn't give us that kind of a, a graphic by which we can live by, where if there is one that I know of, uh, that we're to, supposed to be a spiral, a spiral where we're constantly growing like this all the time, never leveling off like this. And so um, the reason that we do this is because we, we look at the Word of God. God speaks to us the Word. He gives us the Word. And, beloved, we put it away in our mental understanding but we never allow our lives to become consistent with that truth. And we do not experience that truth. We just only understand it. We understand it to where we can teach it to people. We understand it to where it will even affect people emotionally. But, beloved, when a man, when a man faces the Word of God and responds to the Word of God, that man's life is changed morally. And that man's life is changed to it is conformed to the image of that Word. You don't take the Word of God and make it your slave. You take your life and you make your life a slave to the Word of God. And, and what we need to do is to take the Word of God and let it judge us and let it correct us and let it enlarge us and let it bring us to the level of uh, its teachings. Because if you don't do that, uh, you have actually missed the objective of the Word of God. It's amazing about God. He never said anything so perfectly without, uh, without any questions that you do not have to trust Him. And yet He said things so perfectly that, my dear friends, it can correct you and enlarge you and sanctify you and make you like you're supposed to be. That's right. God never said in the Bible not to smoke cigarettes. But He said enough that you can get disturbed about it. Amen. That's amazing, isn't it? That He didn't say stuff like that. Well, you and I have to watch the Word. And tonight, as I deal with this passage, uh, this is a passage that I trust you will let God deal with your heart. I promise you, if you'll let God deal with your heart from the Word, and you will obey the Word then God will not have to deal in your circumstances to bring you to the place where you'll have to obey the Word. Yes, sir. Any time, my friends, God has to work in your circumstances to bring you to the place to obey the Word, it's because you've been spiritually dumb when He's taught you the Word. Yes, sir. That's right. And so God wants us to see the Word tonight. And this is a passage that that I, I can't get over. And I love to preach on things I'm trying to work out and work in and work through. And this is a passage that I cannot work out of, get out of, and I want to leave it with you tonight. It's found in the uh, book of Second Corinthians, the ninth chapter, the eighth verse. I want you to look at this verse. In the King James translation, it says, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Beloved, that is one of the most profound promises in the Bible. I want you to just look at the God that's making this promise to you tonight for just a moment. 
He's the God wherein there's no variableness. There's no shadow of a turn, no shadow of turning. He's not man that he can lie. He can't lie. He can't lie at all. There's no shadow of turning. There's no variableness in him at all. The God that made this promise to you and me tonight is the God that knew you and me before we were substance. He knew us before we were substance. In fact, he wrote down in a book just exactly what you'd become because he knew you so well before you were substance. He wrote down in a book exactly what you'd become and then turned around and laid it out, His will for your life and my life, and left us responsible to living up to it. And then He turned around and said, I'm going to give you grace to enable you to do it. Now, folk, you dealing with a God like that, you can't be going wrong. The God that was able to open up the Red Sea by the breath of His nostrils. Amen. That's the God we're talking about tonight. We're talking about the God, my friend... That when his presence went by in his people of Israel, the Bible says the mountain skipped as lambs and the water fled. That's the God that made this promise. That's right. It's that God that made this promise. And he said, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always, I love that always, Having all, I love that all, sufficiency. In all things, i tell you, is there any place left? I like the encompassing limits of this, uh, uh, boundaries of this verse. You say, what do you mean? Well, he didn't say God is able to make all grace abound towards you as long as you're under 65. Amen. I'm going to tell you something, folk. This verse is my retirement plan. Amen. He didn't even say 95. He said all sufficiency. Always. Under all circumstances, folk. I tell you what, you can retire. It would be safer for you to retire on this verse than it would be from the Texaco company. Now, I'm not kidding you. I mean, folks, this is the Word of God. This is God that runs this thing, saying, my grace. God's grace. I mean, it's something. He didn't say, do you got 65. I love it. Amen. And by the way, he didn't say, he didn't say, if you're well. I, my grace is sufficient as long as you're well. He didn't say that, folk. He said, my grace is sufficient. My grace is able, under all circumstances, under all situations, always sufficient in everything. And my dear friends, he didn't say, as long as you are a well, a well person. I'll tell you, this is the best hospitalization policy you can ever find. Yes, sir. Now, God may use a hospitalization policy, but folks, I'll tell you, this is a good underwriter here. Yes, sir. All sufficiency in all things. He didn't say all sufficiency in all things always if the oil prices are good. That's right. He didn't say all sufficiency in all things if there's not inflation on. Now, folks, this is the Word of God. God said, did you hear it? It says, God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. It doesn't have any kind of limitation on it whatsoever. I mean, there's not one limitation on this promise. I mean, absolutely not one limitation. Now, you may not hear me tonight, but one day you'll hear me. One day you'll remember, my dear friends, a preacher talking about the most encompassing promise to mankind from the Almighty God. And I'll tell you, it's all sufficiency in all things. That's right. This, this, this verse does not take in any kind of limitations whatsoever. I love it because it defines how wealthy a saint is supposed to be. 
You know, this crowd today preaching, uh, uh, name it and claim it, and if you're right with God, you're rich. You hear all of that stuff over the television? I'd like to see those jaybirds go to India and preach that same message. I'd like to see those people who are lying on the Word of God go to Russia and preach the same message and go to China. But I'm going to tell you something, folks. You can go to India, China, our communist uh, countries anywhere in the world. You can go any place you want to and preach this. All sufficiency at all times in all situations. I mean, folks, this will work anywhere. Amen. Amen. And this crowd that says, boy, if you'll just get right with God, and God will make you rich. You know what they're talking about? They're talking about dollars and cents. But this verse is talking about dollars and cents plus. It's like back years ago, a man came to me one time, and he said, Brother Manley, I'd like to put you on a $30,000 a year salary. About About 27 years ago. He said, I'd like to put you on a... $30,000 a $30,000 a year salary, quite a salary back in those days. And I prayed about it, and I said, I can't do it. He said, why? I said, because you're only worth $1 million, and I might need two. You say, what in the world are you talking about, preacher? See, folks, if you're resting on this verse, it says all sufficiency at all times in all places... And I've got news for you, folk. (laughs) A million dollars don't even start it. You say, I don't understand what you're talking about. Let me just give you a little, a sweet note of what I'm talking about. Last Sunday, uh, Saturday, my son and I, John, uh, flew down to uh, San Antonio, Texas. And I preached twice Sunday morning at Castle Hills Baptist Church. And we had... Came back to the room, had lunch, and, and took a rest for a few minutes, and then went to the airport. And when we got to the airport, uh, we realized that we had a 30-minute delay, just 30 minutes to make our flight in Dallas. Well, my dear friends, we got to watching this thing change, and the plane we left San Antonio on was not going through to Oklahoma City, where we were headed. And that plane in San Antonio turned up being an hour late. And I looked at John and I said, John, I said, back when your dad was a young man, I used to live very daringly. I used to plan meetings, stopping on Sunday morning and starting on Sunday night. And I said, all over this country, God worked a miracle one Sunday after another to get me to that place by Sunday night. And I said, John, I said today, this plane says it's it's an hour late. But I said, I want you to see God literally take control of this total airline and get us to Oklahoma City in time to preach Sunday night. Little old John, he didn't know what to say. He Here his daddy was telling him God is sufficient to literally control an airline. An uh, airline where the airplanes cost millions of dollars. And I said, son, you just watch it. And I'll tell you, we left San Antonio one hour late. And we got in Dallas. And when we got in Dallas, the plane that was go- to go to Oklahoma City was sitting there waiting. Usually when you're way late like that, they'll go ahead and give you seats away. And there was the chairman of the board of deacons of the church where I was headed to in Dale City, he and his wife, wanting to get on that plane because there was two seats on that plane and the people wouldn't let them because they were waiting on John and myself to get to that plane so we could get home. Little old John's eyes got big as saucers, folks. But let me tell you something. My dear friends, this promise here is a great deal more than a million dollars. Those airplanes cost more than a million dollars. But my father who says, My grace can be manifested to you that in all situations, all situations you're in, always, he said, you can find the sufficiency you need. My dear friend, listen, you're talking about a promise. Brother, you're talking about a promise. That's something else when you start looking at this promise. And I'm praising God tonight, friend, that there's no limitations on this promise. 
When you start that always business, and that all business, that includes everything, and God's promise is to you, and God's promise is to me right here tonight. Yes, sir. Are you talking about a promise that you can hang your hat on under any kind of situation you have ever, ever, ever found yourself in? This is absolutely a promise you can depend on. Now, what I want you to do tonight is see the context of this promise for just a moment. Paul was writing the church at Corinth. And he had obviously shared with the church at Corinth that the people at Jerusalem needed some help financially. And this crowd at Corinth obviously got up and began to brag about what they were going to do. That's right. They began to brag about what they were going to do for the church at Jerusalem. And so time obviously had passed. It looks like about a year almost had passed. And Paul wrote this church at Corinth and said, Listen, I'm going to send a couple of fellows over there. And I have bragged about you all over the country. And especially to the church at Macedonia, I have bragged about what you're going to do. And you have mouthed off. In other words, he said, you've sort of mouthed off about what you're going to do. So I'm sending these couple of fellows over there to help prepare you. And if you don't do it, they're going to wring it out of you. That's right. He said, they're going to wring it out of you. Now, Paul kept on talking to them. He said, now the church at Macedonia, the church at Macedonia has really laid down the pattern that I want you to see. And this verse, this promise is made in the context of this message to the church at Corinth. And here's what Paul said about the church in Macedonia. He said, these people have actually given out of their poverty unto riches. Now, the amazing thing about it is how he has dealt with it. He said this crowd down there at Macedonia first gave themselves. Secondly, he said they have given what they could afford to give. And thirdly, he said they have been able to give what they could trust God to provide to give. Now, Paul is saying in this context, in the context of the fact that people have given themselves, they have given what they could afford, and they have given what they could trust God for, in that context, he is making this promise. This is the promise that I have read to unite. God is able to make all grace abound towards you, always having all sufficiency in all things may abound unto every good work. My dear friends, during this day and time, people obviously are so blinded by the devil that they actually think they can walk in on the great promises and blessings and benefits of God without having to face the issue of coming to the end of themselves and letting God be God in their situation. But that is not possible, my friend. You cannot leave the cross out of your life and get in on what God's got for you. And this promise tonight is made to me and you. What an awesome promise. What an abounding promise. What a unique promise. But my dear friends, in the context of this promise, you first must realize that the people he's saying this message to must be people who have first given themselves. Man runs around in a conference like this and other meetings and say, Oh God, if you'll just show me what to do, I'll do it. I do not find anywhere in the Bible that God promises to meet people on that level. You say, What do you mean? Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto him, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, 
that you may prove what is that good and acceptable will of God. In John 7:17, 7, the Bible says, The man that wills to know the will of God shall know whether the gospel is of the truth or not, or whether the preaching is of truth that they hear. Now, what I'm trying to say to you is this. Man has a tendency to say, Oh God, you show me what to do, and then I will make a decision as to where I do it. That is not a surrendered man. That is not a person that has given themselves first and foremost. That is a person that is saying, God, you show me what to do so I can decide on whether or not I'm going to do it. That is not a surrendered person. That is not a yielded person. If you're in any kind of question tonight about what God is saying, folks, you can be assured that most of the time it's because you're trying to ask God to show you so you can make up your mind. Your mind is not already made up. Your surrender has not already been made. The surrender has to be made. You have to first give yourself. You have to completely take hands off of your life. You have to completely say, God, whatever you say, this here's my life. I like this illustration. I've used it for years. A absolute surrender is man taking a clean sheet of paper and signing their name on that sheet of paper and turning it into God and saying, Now, God, here's my life. You write on it what you will. That's right. You don't say, God, write on my piece of paper and then I'm going to decide whether I'm going to sign it or not. See, this promise that I've read you tonight is not made to the person who try and run your life. This promise is made to the person who, my dear friends, first and foremost, you have signed that sheet of paper and said, God, there is my life. Yes, sir. There's my life. So if you want this all-sufficiency at all times, under all cir circumstances, folk, there's a price to be paid. And that price is you must sign that sheet of paper and say, God, there is my life. Yes, sir. See, if you want to experience this verse, if you really want to live in the all-sufficiency, you want to know God and live in the all-sufficiency always under all circumstances, you must come to that place of that absolute surrender. And that is giving your life to Him. And if you're not willing to do that, my dear friend, you can be assured that that verse is not applicable to you. You'll not experience it. You want that all-sufficiency at all times under all circumstances? You'll have to take hands off. It'll have to be God, whatever. Yes, sir. That's right. Yes, sir. The second thing, if you want that verse applicable to your life, you want to enjoy that verse, we have to see that you have to give what you can afford to give. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, in the particular context, in the particular context, they're talking about finances. But in the principle of this message, we're talking about a great deal more than finances. You see, when you study the Word of God, you discover the person of Christ, you discover the precepts about God and, you, and Christ, and you, study, you discover the principles. And here we have not only the person of Christ revealed in the Word of God, the precepts about God in the Word of God, but we have the principles that's laid down. And this passage, even though it's applicable about material things, it, in principle, it's applicable about everything. Health, 
family, whatever. Well, whatever. It's, it's absolutely inclusive. I mean, there's no limitations on this verse. None whatsoever. And he's saying here, they gave what they could afford. You see, after you give yourself, then you're free to give what you can afford to give. You say, well, what do you mean? I thought if you gave yourself, you'd be given everything else. Not necessarily. You see, you and I have been blessed with children. We've been blessed with homes. We've been blessed with all kinds of things. And once we give ourselves, it means we just give God freedom to put His finger on whatever He wants. And so then he starts putting his finger on what you and I can afford. Amen. And if you want to get in on this blessing, folk, you've got to not only say, here's my life, you've got to be willing to say, Lord, put out what I can afford. Back years ago, Dr. C.L. Culpepper, who died about six weeks ago, went to China. He signed a sheet of paper. He gave his life for China. And he was out there in China. And one day he rode out of a town on a horse. And as he started riding out of that town on that horse, he saw a pack of dogs dragging some little object. And as he looked closely, it was a body of a child. Well, you see, in that providence of China where he was working, they worshipped. A dog god. And when a little baby died in that, in that town, they would bear that baby three or four inches under the ground without a casket. So the dogs would come and dig it up and drag it and tear its little body and eat its body because they were worshiping God that way. Dr. Culpepper saw, he saw this. He saw these dogs dragging that little body. I mean, it just cut him to the depth of his soul. He had given his life for those people. But he said, Oh God, whatever I can give, I freely give it that these people might see and know the living Lord. Whatever I've got, I can give. It is yours. He had many things he could give. He did not know what would be asked of him. But when he made his trip and came back home, his beautiful little girl, about five years old, was sick. And she died. And when she died, because they were Christians, they made her a beautiful little silk dress for her burial. They built her a beautiful little coffin for her burial. And they took her out and buried her in the first Christian burial that ever took place in that city. And thousands of people came and saw the beauty of this sacred moment. And my dear friends, they began to repent of their sins and turn to Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. And a mighty revival came... Why, beloved, because a man had first given himself and then he gave what he could afford to give. Yes, sir. He gave what he could afford to give. Now, if you want this promise made real to you, all sufficiency in all places at all times, you must not only give yourself, but my friends, you must give what God calls on you to give out of what you have been blessed with. Now, folks, we're getting down to business. None of this foolishness. No spirit of frivolity. We're meaning business. Do you want that promise? Do you want that promise all sufficiency in all times, in all circumstances? Do you want it? Do you really want it? 
They first gave themselves. And then they gave what they could afford to give. And then, the amazing thing about it, they gave what they could trust God for. You say, Brother Manley, what do you mean by that? Well, obviously, from uh, the study of this chapter, these two chapters, uh, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, that the people of Macedonia that were living in poverty learned how to give themselves and then what they could afford, and then they learned how to tap the resources of God. They learned how to tap the resources of God. Where, my dear friends, they were not limited by what they could, what they gave when they gave themselves and what they could afford. They were only limited by the resources of God Almighty. Amen. By faith that, therefore, the only limitation they had was the heavenly will of God and God's ability to supply. And he told the church at Corinth about how they did it. A few months ago, a few months ago, I read that Dr. Oswald J. Smith had died. When I was a young, young man, I used to read his books. And people wonder sometimes how God has blessed me. And one of the things that blessed my life out of Dr. Oswald J. Smith's book is when I was a young man, 19 and 20 and 21, 22, on up till I was 30 years old, so influenced by Oswald J. Smith that when a holiday came like Thanksgiving, rather than go and play and frolic around and satisfy my flesh, I would go and fast and pray every holiday. And Dr. Oswald J. Smith had challenged me to do that. And I would give my life to fasting and praying on those holidays. And uh, it really, really upsets me today when I see the, the moment some of these young boys that's called themselves preachers of the gospel, the first thing they do when they get free of a service is run, grab some stupid ball and go out I want to play ball and all of that junk. It really shows you, folk, where people's souls are and where people's attitude is and what they understand about the eternal things of God. Amen. My dear friend, I love that man. He ministered to me through his books. And then one day, right here at this place, I got to meet that man. I don't even know how old he was when he was here, but oh my, he was so old. But I got to meet him right here. He was right here. He came to my house. And uh, I, it was just such a blessing to know this man. This article, when I read this article about him dying, I thought about all those years. And you know what it said in that article? Listen to me carefully. It said in that article... That this man in his lifetime as member, as pastor of the People's Church, Ontario, Canada, that church and that church alone gave $248 million to missions. The first question came into my mind. How did he do it? How did he do it? And I remember reading those autobi the autobiography of this man. I remember reading all of his sermons and all the other books that he wrote. And I knew how he did it. I knew he first gave himself. And I knew he gave what he could afford to give. But more than that, folk, he learned how to touch the unlimited supply of God and trust God. That church never ran over 3,000 in Sunday school a day. But yet that church in that man's lifetime gave over $248 million to missions. 
Do you know if he pastored that church from the time he was 30 till he was 70, did you know that's somewhere around $4 million a year that church gave the missions? That's right. Over $4 million a year that church gave the mission. And you know what? Not any of them were as successful financially as you are sitting here. I guarantee you, your standard of living right today was at least 50% better than the people of that city. All during his ministry. And he gave $248 million to missions. You say, so what, preacher? Your depth for God and your meaningfulness of God is always determined by what you give away. Not by what you keep. Your holiness before God is revealed by your righteousness before man. Yes, sir. My friends, this man had a secret. It was the secret revealed out of 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. He learned how to tap God's resources. He learned how to live out of God's abundance. He learned how. He first gave himself. Then he gave what he could afford. And then, my dear friends, he gave what he could trust God for. They used to have those fabulous missionary conferences where they would have the missionaries in and they'd send a card home with every member. And that member was to listen to those missionaries and pray for weeks. And weeks they would pray and they would come back having signed those cards saying, this year I'm going to trust God for this amount of money and this amount of money to give. I do not have it, but I will trust God for it. And my dear friends, they began to touch the unbelievable resources of God and they began to be able to give out of God's resources not out of man's. Yes, sir. And that's how they did it. That's how they gave $248 million to missions. You say, Brother Manley, why are you going this direction tonight in the light of where we, we've been? Because, my dear friends, the souls of men are lost and headed to hell and they're going to be there forever. And there's only two ways to reach those people. Either go and preach yourself or send somebody to preach. That's the only two ways there is. Yes, sir. That's right. That's the only two ways. You don't believe it? You look at Romans 10. 10, 10, 13. Thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in thine heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, thou shalt be saved. How shall they believe unless they hear? How shall they hear unless they be set? That's right. There's only two things you can do. You can either go yourself, or you can send someone to go. You may do both. God says all sufficiency at all times, in all places. Doesn't make any difference about the economy of the day. Doesn't make any difference about your health. Doesn't make any difference about retirement. Friends, when you can claim this promise, you've got a promise that will last you till you walk in the gates. Amen. God gave it to you. God gave it to me. God has given it to you. This is not just a promise. This is a what I call a fact. You see, a promise is some of the truth God takes and makes real to you for your given situation. But this is a this is a fact that's applicable to every man, woman, boy, and girl in this building tonight. This promise. This is a fact. God's grace is able to make all sufficiency in all places at all time be yours. You say, Brother Manley, I want to get in on that promise. 
You need to. It's yours. Amen. It's yours. It's absolutely yours, but you'll have to pay a price for it. You'll have to give yourself first. Amen. Then you'll have to be obedient to what he put his finger on. And then, my dear friends, you'll have to be brought to that place and taught how to live by getting what he's got and not what you've got. Live out of his resources. It's yours. It's yours. Do you hear about the fellow that hunted for diamonds all of his life? Hunted for diamonds all his life. Really did. Sold the farm he was living on. And the greatest discovery of diamonds in all the history of the world was on the farm he owned. And tonight, my friend, God has given you a diamond mine in this promise. I mean, it's the Word of God, folks. It's not my opinion. It's not my interpretation of this verse. It is the Word of God. It's yours. He's given it to you. Are you going to sell it out for a miss of pottage? Are you going to sell out your birthrights? This is your birthright. I'm not preaching having against money, not preaching against having insurance. I'm not preaching against my dear friends having a retirement program. But I'm going to tell you one thing. If the underwriter hasn't underwritten written your program, your program will dry up. But this one won't dry up. It doesn't make any difference what happens. It doesn't make any difference where you are. This promise, this fact will go with you wherever you go. Whatever you do, it'll go with you. I, I tell you, I can't say enough about this, this verse. All sufficiency, always, under all circumstances. It's a little hard to get a hold of, isn't it? Amen? Just sort of hard to get a hold of. But there'll come a day when you'll have to say, God, there's nothing else I can do. That's right. But cling to you. You don't think you have that occasion coming in your life, but it will. Amen. It will come. I don't care how much money you save up, it'll still come. Amen. I don't care how healthy you try to keep your body, it'll still come. I don't care how secure you try to keep your family, it will still come. I don't care who you are, friends. I don't care what you are tonight. I'll come a day when you will need this all-sufficiency at all times, in all places. And friend, you have no right to it. Until you have first given yourself. Until you have been obedient to what God has said do. Until you have learned to trust Him as the source and only source with all of His unlimited resources. And when you got there, folk, then this promise is yours. This message is yours. It's yours to experience and live by and live in it lavishly. Amen. But until then, you have no right to it whatsoever. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Tonight, as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, All I have tried to do is take a verse out of the Bible and hold up its standard before you. You know whether or not tonight you're experiencing this verse. I realize that you're working the best you know how to work to keep yourself out of trouble to where you'll have to depend on God. I know that. That's obvious. 
But folks, that's not going to get you in on what God's got planned for your life. You're going to have to come to the end and get beyond yourself out on Him. And so I trust tonight that as the lost world is standing out there awaiting for you and me to respond to their need, that some way, somehow, tonight, we can get in on what God has planned for our lives. Are you willing to say, Lord Jesus, here is my life? Without any reservation, write on it what you will. Are you willing to say, oh God, I know my life is surrendered. Show me anything that must be done by me to make it possible for you to do what you want to do through my life. God, are you willing to say, oh God, tonight, me in all my poverty, teach me how to live in such a way that I can give away my life and give away what I can trust you for. My friend, we're living in such poverty tonight. Spiritually, we're living in such poverty tonight in this whole world because we have not learned how to trust God in His mighty grace. Would you let Jesus have His way in your heart tonight? Would you do that? If God has talked to your heart tonight without any music, God's been talking to you during these days, I want you to just get up out of that seat and come and let God deal with that area. He's dealing with your heart. You say, what do you mean, Brother Manley? I mean like Abraham. Abraham had yielded all to Jesus. But my dear friends, one day God said, you can give something away. You can give your son Isaac away. The very thing that God blessed him with, he called on him and said, I want that. Are you willing to say, oh God, I can, I, I can afford it, but I can't take it. Take this tonight. Are you willing? Are you willing to ask God to teach you and lead you how to tap in on his resources, not your ability, and let him have his way with you? Would you come tonight? No music? You just get up out of that seat. Some have come. You come. Lord, whatever it takes. It may be that, friend, one day back in your life, you said, Lord, whatever it takes. But you've taken that back. You've taken it back. And you have literally run your own life. It may be tonight you need to renew that covenant with God. Would you come? Young lady, young man, mother, father. If you are willing to say, God, whatever, I believe you can get in on this all-sufficiency at all times, under all situations. I believe you can do it. Would you come? As people are continuing to come, would you come? Would you come tonight? God's dealing with your heart. You come. Sign that sheet of paper. Say, Lord, here's my life. Here's my life, Lord. Brother Jimmy.